Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Taking Control of Your Finances. And uh, I'm so pleased that you joined us today. And hopefully you all receive the handouts uh, for today. We'll be referring to them as we go along. Um, and we're just going to go right ahead and get started here. So I am Maria Papitas with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. And I am uh, really pleased to be with you and in partnership with uh, Ed Gutzeit, who is a Master of Financial Education volunteer with Cooperative Extension. and uh, Jen Tozer, who's a manager of family engagement with the Division of Developmental Disability Services at the Department of Health and Social Services. And I'm really pleased that, you know, my organization and the, the Delaware uh, Division of Developmental Services, Disability Services have been working together to uh, bring to you this program and the rest of the series that you all know about. So thank you all for joining us today. So let's get started, right? So I, um, I have been teaching financial management for, gosh, almost 30 years. Um, I have learned a thing or two, I guess, about money management and strategies to kind of take control of your finances. And one of the things that um, I have learned as I've worked with many people is that, you know, money management really has to be learned. We, you know, somehow uh, we, we learn it from our parents uh, or from um, the people who have raised us. And that can be a good thing or a bad thing, uh, depending on what their practices were. And uh, oftentimes we don't get the chance to take a class to learn about money management. We just sort of grow into it and get exposed to things and try and do the best we can. But it can be learned and in a way it can be practiced so that you can build the strong skills, practical skills, kind of good decision making that helps helps us succeed with our finances. And oftentimes we need to really include everybody in the household. So because income typically comes into a household, uh, the decisions about how to use money wisely in order to achieve goals sometimes relies on us independently, but oftentimes um, you, there's an impact from other family members in terms of how money gets spent. And so it really means talking about money and um, trying to make decisions together. So it may not be easy uh, because of that communication and the needing, the needing to really discuss things and make decisions together. Sometimes that can be hard. And the other thing that I've learned is there's no right or wrong way. There's strategies, right, and, and understanding one's own financial behavior and the way we make decisions, but how I might do things um, might be different than the way Jennifer does or the way Ed does because of um, what will work best for us. So there is no right or wrong way. There's just trying to figure out where we want to go and what strategies will help us get there. So we're going to talk a lot about that today. So the other thing that I've learned from the very beginning is there is this budget equation. And by a budget equation, I mean the math part of money management. And so the math part of management, money management is the income, meaning what's coming in, has to add up or has to equal what we spend it on, what we save for, and what we pay for, for debt payments. The math, the goal, is that that equation should be equal. The income should, should equal what's all the places that money is going out. So when we find that we don't have enough money, right, our income isn't enough to cover spending, savings, and debt, that's when we get into trouble. So I really encourage people to think about the math part has to, has to always end up 
uh, being equal, right? Income's got to equal those spending savings and debts. The hard part, right? The hard part is the tough trade-offs that we have to make, the conversations that we need to have in order to best use the money so that it equals what comes in. So one of the things that I really encourage people to do is to create a picture of where you want to be. And so if you close your eyes and picture in your head, you know, where you want to be in say next year or two to three years. And by that, I mean, you know, physically, where do you want to be? What is around you? Who is around you? What have you accomplished? What are some of the tasks that you um, have set for yourself and that you have accomplished? And to kind of create a picture of yourself and whoever it else needs to be around you. And I want you to put a big smile on your face because you've actually accomplished those things is really important because the science says if we have a really clear picture in our head, right, if we've got it in our head, our body will eventually follow. Creating a picture of where you want to be will help you accomplish those things that are most important to you and get you where you want to be. The other thing that's really important to know about from a, a scientific perspective is that our brain, that our brain works in pictures. And so it's really important to have those pictures in your brain so that you can stay on track and stay motivated. The other thing that's really important to know about our brain is it doesn't like the words not and can't and don't. I'm going to use an example. Like if I say, don't eat the chocolate cake, what do you see? What comes, what picture comes into your brain? Yeah, and Sabrina says, I want the cake, right? So that's what happens in our brain. Our brain sees the chocolate cake and wants it, right? I want to eat it. And so to me, this is sort of a, like a, a little lesson, right? If our, even though I said, don't eat the chocolate cake, what do we want to do? We want to eat it. So it's an important lesson because how we talk to ourselves, how we frame things is really important for our success. So if we say, I'm not going to eat out anymore, I'm not going to spend money on soda at the soda machine. I'm not going to, right? We, our brain, right, is going to see the soda machine. Our brain is going to see the going out to eat. It's not going to see the not doing those things. So what does that mean? That means that when we want ourselves to change, when we want to move forward, we have to frame things in a positive way. Like, I'm only going to have one soda out of the soda machine, you know, uh, a week, right? Or I'm going to uh, only eat out once a week. See what I'm saying? So I flipped the concept and the picture in our head, right? And so if I say to myself, I am going to allow myself to eat out once a week. I feel good about that and I can't wait to do that. And I can think about then where am I gonna do that? Where am I gonna take myself out to eat and feel good about it, right? Instead of I'm not gonna eat out to save money and then feeling bad about it. And then we wanna go out and eat, eat out anyway. See what I'm saying? So it's really important how we frame things in our head. And so this notion of where do you want to be? It can't be about, well, I'm not going to do this. It has to be about, I want this. I need this. I, I want to create a picture of myself with a big smiling face of the things that I want around me in two to three years or whatever time frame and use those visuals to remind you of that picture. Sometimes I have people, when I have more time in workshops, is like, get out 
the crayons, get out the markers, get out a pencil and just draw the picture and then put it up somewhere where you'll see it. Maybe it's in the bathroom, maybe it's on the back of your bedroom door, some place where you will see it every day and then your body will start to follow. Really important, gotta uh, work with the way our brain works. So the next thing we need to think about, right? So when you create that picture, in a sense, you're creating some goals. And I like to um, encourage people to sort of think about goal setting uh, from a financial standpoint. We tend to think of these, uh, this, this triangle of uh, what are the goals we need to set and how do they kind of build on one another. And so when we talk about building a strong financial foundation, it's about making sure what is coming in in terms of income is greater than or equal to what gets uh, what is going out meaning what you're spending on or saving on or the debt payment and that is a very important foundation and once we kind of get that squared away that's when we can start accessing credit because we know now we have a little bit of money left over and we can actually pay the debt or save for an emergency get money set aside for when an emergency might come or begin to set savings goals for other things like education or home ownership, um, getting covered by insurance, if that's uh, something that, that needs to be done. And then maybe even eventually investing, right? Uh, earning some in income off of uh, your savings and then thinking about estate planning. So all of that really, uh, is the foundation, right? Setting, creating a good solvency is the foundation for everything kind of going forward. And then as we think about those pictures in our head, we need to also be thinking about, you know, what is that, what are some of those uh, goals that we want to set? And for many people, typical goals are things like increasing savings for those emergencies or unexpected expenses or reducing debt or, or saving for some of those fun things like vacation or education or, or starting a business or, or doing something in the future. And so that picture that I had you create in your head is exactly that, right? It's what do I want in the future? And so creating, you know, creating goals is an important strategy for helping you make tough decisions. And by that, I mean, you know, every time you go into the supermarket and you go to the checkout counter and there are those things on the, on the display of all of those little things that like, oh, I could spend a dollar and a half and buy this or get this magazine or get those uh, uh, lifesavers or, or whatever, you know, all of those kind of uh, impulse buys. Well, if you have that picture of where you would rather spend your money in your head, it's easier to say no to those things that can um, encourage us to spend on trivial things. So by knowing where you wanna go, it's easier to say no to those less important things. Setting goals also helps you keep on track for where you want to get to, and it helps encourage conversations with, okay, I'm choosing to do this, and I'm not choosing to do that because it, uh, it throws me off. And so you can have a conversation then with friends and family about, well, I'm, we're, we're, I'm not doing this because of this goal, or let's do this together because we have this goal. So encouraging communication is a great strategy for uh, helping achieve some of those goals. Now, oftentimes I get questions about, so what's my time frame? You know, when I hear things on the news, they talk about five years, 10 years, more than 10 years away. And frankly, I can't even think that far ahead. Uh, for many people, that's difficult. And so what I like to encourage people to do is figure out what your time frame is. So for example, as you're thinking about money, is your short term this week and your intermediate next week and your long term next month, right? Or is it one year, one to five years or five years or more? Or is it this, you know, less than five years, five to 10 years or over 10 years, right? 
what's your typical time, time frame? And no matter what your typical time frame is, I'm going to encourage you to take one step out. Think one more time frame further. So if we're talking about this week, next week, and next month, I'm going to encourage you to think about what do I need to be thinking about for six months from now when it comes to my finances. And if it's this one year, one to five, or five years or more, then maybe it's um, getting yourself to stretch a little bit. It's like, but what about 10 years from now? What do I need to be thinking about for 10 years from now? And then the same goes for this five, five to 10 and 10 years. And so if you're already in this time frame, then maybe it's about, well, what do I need to be thinking about for 20 years from now or when I am moving towards retirement? It's important to stretch and it's important to plan for some of those things that are upcoming. And when we talk about goals, we talk about steps to achieving goals. We talk about, many organizations talk about SMART goals. And SMART goals, you know, we use this word SMART to kind of help us remember SMART goals are specific. So it's as much detail as you can uh, give the goal. And it needs to be measurable. And by that, it may be, uh, you know, like how much money do I need to save? Or in what time frame do I, uh, am I working? It has to be achievable within your, um, in this case, financial situation, right? For me to say, I'm going to save $50,000 by the end of the year is never going to happen. It's not achievable in my financial situation. And being realistic, right? And then also timely, meaning it needs to be in a good time frame. So when I, um, when I think about uh, short-term goals or SMART goals, it's about clearly identifying and writing down those goals and putting a price tag on those goals and trying to set a specific date for when I'd like to achieve that goal and then developing that plan so I can and then begin working on it now. <clears throat> it's so easy to kind of put things off. Picturing the goal in your head, that really helps. If you can really see yourself sitting on the beach, right? If that's the goal, I wanna go on vacation and go to the beach. If you can see yourself sitting at the beach, it helps motivate you to save for that goal. And then lastly, you know, evaluate your success, right? Are you actually moving towards uh, that goal? Um, is the plan and the strategy that you've put into place, is the time frame uh, working? Is the goal specific enough to help you move forward? And if not, well, guess what? Then you just readjust, right? Here's the difference between two goals, right? I need a new car. That's this big fuzzy thing that's out there versus I need a reliable car by December that has a monthly payment of less than $250 a month and is still affordable if I can put down $2,000 and pay it off in five years. Oh, and I'd like it to be blue and four door. <laughs> I have to say when I first got, you know, I first got out of college, like that picture of me sitting in a blue four door uh, car was what I pictured, right? And it wasn't until my, my money sense dad says, no, no, Maria, let's put a time frame on this. Let's figure out how much you can afford and how much savings we, 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 we need to create in order for you to have a down payment, right? He helped me be more specific, right? So it's by getting to the specifics that it can really help us uh, move forward in our goal. So I just want to stop there and see if there's any questions before I move on to uh, kind of this idea of developing a spending plan. All right, so let's talk about developing a spending plan. So developing a spending plan, so developing a spending plan, there are steps to that, right? It's figuring out what's coming in and what's going out, uh, at both maybe on a monthly basis, but also maybe a periodic, uh, periodic expenses, and we'll talk a little bit about what those are. And we want to create a plan that incorporates in some of those goals and the debt 
right? And then once we kind of take a look at all that, that whole picture, including some of those goals, we can begin to refine what that expense um, worksheet or the spending plan needs to look like. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so one of the tools I sent you, right, is a spending plan. And there may be way more expense categories in here than you may ever need or use. But it's important, many people forget about all the different places their money goes. So <clears throat> I offer this a spending plan as a tool to help you kind of see, well, where are all the different places my money goes or that our money goes in terms of a, if it's a family a spending plan. And so you can see there's things related to the income, right? Uh, and also some of the things that might be coming out of that income right off the top that so it kind of lowers our uh, our total income and become sort of a net income because all of those things come out. And then what do we have in terms of housing expenses and utilities like electric and water and sewer and telephone? <clears throat> and then what about food and all the different places that we get food, whether it's the grocery or eating out or having to uh, pay for school lunches if we have children? What about cars? and some of the personal things and family care, right? All of those are places where our money can go. Then there's um, things like health and medical insurance and expenses around education. And if you have a pet and entertainment and, and uh, a credit um, and Notice that there's places for gifts and charitable contributions, right? And so this might be gifts to others, like birthdays or Christmas, uh, but it could also be contributions to your favorite charity. And then down here is a place for some of those additional savings goals that we talked about. <clears throat> One of the other things that may be new in terms of your thinking about spending plans is this idea of saving for and or recognizing and saving for periodic expenses. And so periodic expenses are things that come up once in a while, uh, maybe twice a year. So uh, off the top of my head, it might be things like, um, uh, like dues to an organization, it may be um, it may be birthdays, it may be holidays, and so when I think about this for my own self, I kind of go uh, month by month, and I might say, all right, January, what happens in January where I might spend money a little bit differently than normal? Okay, uh, let's see. January first is New Year's Day. And I typically have my family over, my mom and my sisters and my, all my nieces and nephews. And, and I say, okay, well, what do I spend differently because everybody's coming to dinner? And then maybe Valentine's Day in February. Well, do I give my spouse a gift? Well, you know I do, right? So what do I spend differently because Valentine's Day has happened? And March, well, in my family, we have three people who have birthdays in March. So, okay, what am I spending differently? How much? And the idea here is to actually put numbers in here, right? So uh, maybe I spend $25 on a gift card for uh, my, my two nieces and my mom, right, for, um, for their birthdays. So then I would put $75 in March. Right. So the idea is here is to get as specific as possible <clears throat> and go throughout the year and add it up, right, and divide by 12. <clears throat> and then what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, this is the amount of money I need to put aside every month so I have it when I need it. <clears throat> so that when that birthday comes, I know I have set aside some money 
so that I can spend it and not feel guilty and it won't throw the rest of my spending plan off. <clears throat> So, so it's important to sort of understand, well, where are all the places my money comes from? <clears throat> and that's really the place to start, right? Um, and here are all different kinds of places money can come from. <clears throat> so it can be, um, so it can be, you know, wages and salary or um, uh, kind of assistance programs like SSI or TANF or WIC or even um, <clears throat> health insurance, you know, Medi Medicaid, um, you know, any time that there's opportunities for income to kind of be coming in. And then um, the ABLE accounts or the trust accounts where money might be coming in and looking at those sort of, I'll just call them reliable, um, maybe monthly income sources. And then there might be some other things that will help us kind of raise a little bit of extra money so that we can put them towards those goals like garage sales or, or doing some hobbies, you know, doing crafts and selling them or um, free, some sort of freelance work. <clears throat> And then also looking at, you know, are there places where people are helping you out? <clears throat> um, maybe they're gifting you money, right? That helps you cover your expenses. So it's important to kind of recognize what all those income store sources are, and then begin to look at what are those um, monthly expenses, right? And we talk about fixed expenses being things that are the same every month. Now notice savings is in the fixed category one of the most important things you can do is what we call pay yourself first. And maybe it's $5 a month, doesn't matter, but you're putting that money aside because you know that you're setting aside for things that are expenses that it might be upcoming or goals that you have for yourself. The next is flexible. And so you can see we call it flexible because they go up and down every month. And, <clears throat> and so they change every month. Um, and so that they're the ones that we kind of have to um, maybe uh, things that we can change every month in order to help our budget equation add up and maybe things that we don't we can choose not to purchase because we're um, saving money for things that are more important um, and then they're just things that we don't necessarily need every month <clears throat> Periodic expenses, and I kind of mentioned those already, but they're the things that come periodically that we want to begin to build in to our monthly plan. So monthly expenses really is about, you know, prioritizing our spending and recognizing the difference between what's fixed and what's flexible. <clears throat> Sometimes what's fixed in one family may be flexible in another. So for example, some people who work and who have childcare that might be a fixed expense because every week they're paying somebody to take care of their children. Whereas others, maybe it's a periodic babysitting uh, expense. Notice that I've put in here savings, oh, like the best practice these days is to fix, to set aside 10% of your fixed expenses, 10% of your income as a fixed expense. And that way, uh, that way you know you have money being saved for those important things. The other thing I really encourage people to think about is an allowance. And whether you're a child or an older person, it's okay to have an allowance, but it's a set amount that each person has control over. And really, you know, you don't have to be accountable to anyone else for that money. But I think the key is it's a set amount. So it doesn't change from month to month. And so as you're building your spending plan, you're saying, okay, say $20 a week is, giving to, is gonna be given to Maria and she can spend it however she wants. But Maria doesn't get any more than $20 a week, right? <clears throat> so again, that amount depends on the rest of the budget or uh, the rest of the expenses. It has to be built in, it has to be affordable. 
All right, I really encourage people to save and to save regularly, as I mentioned, and to really start that emergency fund. Uh, they talk about um, at least having, you know, or to think about the kinds of tip, the typical kinds of quote emergencies that might happen that you are responsible for. So if you're responsible for replacing the refrigerator, if it breaks, then how much is a new refrigerator going to cost? Or if you are responsible for a health insurance deductible, how much is that deductible? And to begin to think about kind of what are those um, more immediate emergency expenditures that you need to set aside money for. So maybe that's $1,000, maybe it's $1,500 but we're saving for uh, that unexpected event. <clears throat> and then the other piece that we're saving for is those future goals and those things that you create, that you want to create for yourself. And I put in here the slide, you know, remember your picture, right? All right, what about debts? Debts are an important <clears throat> part of our spending plan. If you, are, if you have credit, it's important to pay it off as quickly as possible. The longer it takes to help to, that you pay out, uh, that you pay for credit, the more expensive it is. And so it's important to really have a plan for paying down your debt. And I offer this powerpay.org website developed by the University of Utah Cooperative Extension to help you pay down your debt in the fastest, cheapest way. So if you have uh, challenges with debt, that's a whole other workshop that we can offer. <clears throat> uh, but um, getting a handle on who you owe and how much and what that monthly payment is and building it into the spending plan is really important. Okay, so now we have this spending plan and it's kind of filled out, right? Uh, with those fixed expenses and the flexible expenses and our periodic expenses and our savings and our debt payment. And we look at it and we add it up and we compare it to the income and we go, oh my gosh, I'm spending more than I'm bringing in. And my guess is part of that is because you've never built in those goals and the savings. And so if we think that those things are important, then we need to begin to refine and readjust, readjust the plan so that income equals all the places that you really want your money to go. So looking for and prioritizing where your money is going uh, is really important. And oftentimes when I sit down with uh, clients, I kind of say, all right, if you had three stars, so, uh, uh, assuming that sort of all the needs are being covered, like the housing and the food and <clears throat> transportation and insurances, for example, assuming all those are being covered by the income, if you had two stars or three stars, where would you spend your money? What are the priority areas you would spend your money in? Is it uh, new clothing? Is it eating out? Is it education? Is it, and so if you put stars next to places that are really important to you, then you can begin to see what is less important. And maybe those are the areas you're, where you can begin to reduce expenses. And you don't necessarily have to say, I'm never gonna do this again, because remember that's a don't word, right? We're not gonna feel good about that but how do we reduce it? So that notion of, okay, uh, instead of eating out lunch every day, I'm gonna eat out lunch twice a week. So that's where I'm saying, don't necessarily eliminate it, just reduce it. <clears throat> the other thing that you can do is start to think about ways to maybe increase income, and that might be the earned income tax credit. It could be working with the volunteer income tax assistance program to make sure that you're filing taxes in the way that best maximizes your money, use of your money. Then of course you want to look at where are the freebies. You know, I'm sure you all have ideas of some of those freebies that are out there. I personally love the library. You know, you can get all sorts of things from the library, books and videos and uh, books on CD and all kinds of things. One of the best places 
I think, uh, is a lot to get some of those freebies as the libraries. But if you have other ideas, ideas you want to share, go ahead, put them in the chat. And that way everybody can learn from your um, resourcefulness. The other thing I really encourage people to do is share resources. Look around you. What are you good at? What's your neighbor good at? Can you wash their windows if they're willing to watch your dog? Right? Can you can you barter or share like that? One of the things I found is I went to my I have two sisters and I went to both their houses and we had the same magazines and I said to them, this is so silly. Why don't I get this one and you get the other one and then we'll share. <clears throat> And that's working out great and it really helped reduce some magazine costs, right? Other ideas, you know, try and work towards reducing debt and uh, another is really engaging kids in the process because um, they are often a place where lots of money uh, gets spent and if they help in the family decision making and where the money's going um, and they're working on a goal with you it can often oftentimes make life a lot easier so what we're trying to do here then is if you've got your budget sheet work filled out and your income is less than where your money is going you're looking at places to reduce your spending so that you have a little bit more money to save and you have a little bit more money to set aside for those periodic expenses that you know are going to come. And that helps you kind of balance that budget, right? Either reducing expenses or increasing income. And compare, so you're comparing what's coming in versus what's going out and you're looking at the difference. Is it $50? Is it $100? Is it $200, right? But once you take a look, then you can start to make some good decisions about where you want your money to really go so that it helps you create that picture that you had in your head, makes it a reality. So this is a little uh, tip that I've found along the way has been very helpful and that is figure out how much you really make per hour and then apply that amount to everything you buy. So as an example, say I make $12 an hour and I'm looking at a new outfit and that outfit is $75. And so I would ask myself, is this new outfit worth, I made, I made the math hard. Uh, <laughs> let's say I made $10 an hour. <laughs> Is this outfit worth 10 and a half, sorry, seven and a half hours of my life, right? <clears throat> and the answer might be yes, but the answer probably is no, <laughs> right? Maybe it's not worth seven and a half hours of my life. Maybe I can spend that $75 in a better place uh, for something that's more important to me. So I use that as a tip. Because if we kind of connect it back to how we spend our time and the value of our time, uh, we often can make different decisions. All right, so given the time, I think what I'm going to kind of focus on, you know, making sure that your record keeping, right, you need to kind of set up a record keeping system and track where your money goes. Um, one of the things that I have tried is uh, just sort of a notebook, right? Or maybe it's a, a computer uh, spreadsheet, right? If you're good at those things and writing it down, even if it's for two weeks, write down where all your money goes and then double it. And that way you get a good sense of where your money is going and you can make it, uh, you can make some decisions about, is that really where you want your money to go? But you need to kind of come up with a record keeping system that's simple and that is, you know, kind of in one place and figuring out who is responsible uh, and develop a schedule. And oftentimes using a calendar is a, a, a good tool. So for example, I uh, have a very simple um, strategy. Um, I uh, keep my receipts. I have a little box and as I, make purchases with cash. I keep the receipt, 
or I have a pad of paper in my car and I write down what I wrote and how much and then I keep a box in my house and I put all the receipts in that. In that. Um, and then of course I'm using online purchasing so I can kind of keep track of that. Uh, and then once a month, well, actually twice a month, twice a month I sit down and I write my bills. So around the 10th of the month, I write bills for what's coming up and due by the end of the month. And I also then kind of organize the previous month's records. So I have a sense of how much I spent where. And then around the end of the month, I do the same thing. I kind of look at uh, pay the bills that are coming up for the first, coming up for the next uh, 15 days. I write those bills, pay those checks, um, do my e-banking, uh, and then take a look again at where my spending has been over the last couple of weeks. And then I just keep it in a notebook. And I do that because I'm on the computer all the time. And the last thing I want to do is go back in and play on the computer with my finances. Other people are different. And so that's why I say, you know, do what works and keep it simple. Using calendars is another great tool. Some people write, they just have a calendar just for their money. So what's coming in goes on the dates where they know it's coming in. What's going out gets written on the dates where they know uh, they have to pay a bill. And it reminds them and it, and it keeps them organized. So I wanted to pro pro uh, provide some additional money management uh, resources. Um, there is an organization in Delaware, we're very unique this way, we have an organization called Stand By Me, and they do an amazing job of doing one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. And so um, by going to the website, you can actually set up an appointment with a financial coach and they handle all sorts of money related questions. There's another organization called the Delaware Money School <clears throat> uh, who offers uh, all sorts of uh, topical uh, workshops. Right now they're all online. Um, I've been doing a lot of those myself, uh, but there are other people out there who are doing workshops as well. Um, in terms of things that might be, uh, I don't know, um, more issue oriented, right? If you have a kind of a debt issue, you're, you're trying to figure out how to pay down debt. Uh, Consumer Credit Counseling Service of Maryland and Delaware is a great resource. In terms of finding additional resources, dialing 211 um, is a, another great resource. And you can just say, hey, I'm needing help with whatever it is. And they um, will be able to help you kind of locate local resources. Uh, if you're feeling like there's been some fraud issues or some concerns, some legal concerns, uh, the next few bullets are uh, resources that you can connect to. So some last words of wisdom from me is, you know, financial management is a journey and we learn as we go. And so we kind of have to be patient with ourselves because we're relearning. Uh, but as we get older and wiser, right, we can make better decisions and continue to learn how to use our money wisely. Kind of related to that is it's okay to say that you don't know and then figure out where you can find out the answers and ask for help if you need it. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, we're, we live in kind of a weird society where we don't like to talk about money and there's lots of feelings around money topics. And so, it's important to try to share those, sort them out, kind of figure out, you know, how to resolve them so that it can make you and your relationships and your financial uh, well-being uh, more strong. And so um, I see that Patrick asked a question about why start with gross versus net. And that's a really great question when we're talking about developing a plan and kind of looking at what's coming in and what's going out. And um, again, this is one of those things, Patrick, where it depends on how confident uh, you are in terms of looking at the whole financial picture, which is why I would, the one worksheet kind of starts with gross and you begin to articulate and, and document what the, um, 
um, what the sort of automatic deductions are going to be versus looking at the net and starting from there. And, and that's fine too, if that is your comfort level. So for some people, um, for example, they can automatically deduct money uh, out of their paycheck and putting it into a savings account. <clears throat> and so if you're just looking at the net, then um, another that then that's something that you would miss in terms of creating that spending plan. So again, some of it has to do with how your uh, how your paycheck works, what's being deducted out of there, and um, and or what's not, and how do you make sure that then it adds up right uh, on on it adds up correctly and you have a good sense of where your money's going. So Sabrina uh, asks, if I want to see this meeting again, where can I find it? Uh, we're gonna post that and as soon as we get them posted, uh, we can send that out to you. I don't have the link right this very minute, Sabrina, but we'll get that out to you. So I will encourage you to Share your thoughts about this training, a URL that you can go to to provide us some feedback. It's anonymous. Uh, there's no way we can track it back to you, but we would really appreciate your feedback and your thoughts about, you know, kind of what you learned today, what else you'd like to learn about, what was good, what wasn't so good, uh, those kinds of things. It will take you to an online Qualtrics survey um, later. So we'd be, it would be great to, to get some feedback from, from you all.